But what I imagine has happened is that TikTok grew from a from a very small organization to this large global phenomenon that all of these kids are using. And then now the Chinese government has a vested interest in the amount of data that they're pulling in. Did you move down to Tampa yet? No, not yet. We got we booked our Airbnb in a, um, on Barefoot Beach last night. So nice. Yep. So we're going to be headed down at the end of August and uh, that's it. And then we're going to be house hunting. So stoked. Amazing. I know. I'm, uh, I'm in Colorado. Are you really? No kidding. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm in this cabin. Like nice. I don't know if you can see outside, but. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, just, man. It was tough, you know, because doing so much travel for work and, you know, last year and then not going anywhere for seven or eight months. I was like, what's yeah. a socially distanced place I can go, you know? Yeah. And this, this actually ended up working nicely because it's like a very, very small town, two, mm-hmm. two and a half hours outside of uh, Denver, just up in the mountains. And that's awesome. How do you yeah. feel? How do you feel? You feel good? I feel good. I had that like little bit of a uh, like headache feel that you get sometimes when you go yeah. from being at sea level to mm-hmm. thousands of feet above sea level. <laughs> Yeah, after a couple of days, it kind of goes away, but that's that's real. Good thing you didn't get sick or anything. You feel good? I feel good, yeah. Usually, yeah. it's just like a headache and then drink a lot of water, and then in 24 hours, it's like you're acclimated yeah. or you yeah. feel better. It's yeah. so peaceful there, man. Like half of my team is in Colorado. We've got like 35 people in Colorado, and um, it's just amazing there. It's so peaceful, so peaceful. Yeah, I went on a run this morning, and I was like, I'm in a pretty remote area. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I'm, like, I'm running up this mountain like David goggins myself and nice. my head, you know and then all of a sudden like this thought got into my head that there was a mountain lion behind me <laughs> hey I was just look like, it's real it's real out there i went for a run this morning but i'm in new york so uh not not like that but yeah there's some crazy animals out there yeah and i was like if i had a pocket knife that wouldn't do anything to a mountain lion <laughs> No, no, you got to have at least some bear spray on you and maybe even a pistol out there. So, right. <laughs> the mountain lion would like use my pocket yeah. knife as a toothpick after he ate yeah. me. <laughs> Those animals are no joke, man. They're no joke. That's awesome, though. That looks so peaceful out there. Did you bring the family with it or just you? <laughs> no, that's why it's peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I'm like, that's, uh, that's got to be a trip, man. How long are you staying out there for? A week. So one of the uh, starters of this was, I was we, co- we come out here a lot. Like, mm-hmm. We try to come out here every year. Um, this year, though, when the COVID thing happened, my wife started refinishing cabinets. Yeah. And that business is growing for her. And now she's making more money doing that than she was before. So her, wow. she's like really happy that she's got all this work and she's like, Oh no, you know, you just go and that's fine. Cause I travel a lot by myself. Yeah. So it was pretty exciting. And I was like, Oh, I'm so excited that I get all these awesome podcasts. I was looking at my, like all the different people I get to talk to. And I was super excited to talk with you, especially since, since our last conversation, there's like been new news on TikTok. There's been a lot of new news on TikTok. Yeah. Did you see it last night? Microsoft potential acquisition of TikTok. Yeah, what's going on? Like, what's going on from a security perspective with TikTok? You know, it's one of those things to where, um, you know, TikTok is, they are, they're a company owned by, by a Chinese company. They're, they're a Chinese company. And for a very long time now, the Chinese government has had the ability to snoop into any Chinese company that they want to. So when we look at it from a security and privacy perspective, it's like, you know, they have access, the Chinese government has access to everything on TikTok. They have to. They're mandated to give the government access to all of their data. So when you start to compile how much data that really is and what it really means as far as facial recognition, as far as body language and being able to pick people out in an airport and identify them from an online persona by the way that they move. I mean, it is creepy. Not only that, it's... um you know, the Chinese government, if they do have access to an application, there's nothing to really stop them from, let's say, turning on your microphone or turning on the camera while you're not, you know, using it. So there's a whole bunch of security and privacy implications behind TikTok. Microsoft acquisition, that's a whole nother animal. They're going to need to tread really, really carefully because of how, how many heavy Microsoft uh, contracts that they have with the, with the federal government and the intelligence community. So that's going to be a doozy. 
Yeah, that's interesting. If they take, if Microsoft took it away from the Chinese company, yeah, then it would be like, you know, the first question I have is from a technology perspective, would they like clone the code base or would they like just operate the TikTok users and have like a separated code base or database right. for US or UK users? Or, you know, how would they actually create that segmentation so that the data doesn't get yeah. routed back to them? Well, logistically, it's really interesting because TikTok's been like, it's been like a flagship for government involvement into applications and something that we've not really seen too much of before to where the government is actually stepping in to say, stop using it. And um, it's been really interesting to see under the current administration of what that's actually looking like on the privacy side. And they've actually mandated a lot of agencies to not use these applications, TikTok being one of them for federal employees, right? You're not supposed to use it because they can snoop in on your conversations. And you're, if you're a covert CIA agent, right? And your kids using TikTok in the house, that could have some pretty wild security implications for you um, that could go a little bit further than anticipated. So it's crazy. It's crazy. I honestly, if I could make a prediction, I think that if they will purchase uh, TikTok, it's going to change almost completely overnight the 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 logistics of it the location of the data how they use the data and microsoft is very careful nowadays um some would definitely disagree with that i understand microsoft services are very chatty and send a lot of data um, but microsoft is a u.s company and they do have to abide by those privacy regulations or so they they will get dinged for it so uh chinese companies not so much though not so much yeah, I also saw that Apple removed like 20 something thousand apps from the Chinese app store. Did you did you catch that? Yeah, that's a lot. It's a lot. And Android is even worse. I mean, Android is like the Wild West, right? I'm a big fan of Android because, you know, I'm a hacker. So I really like playing around with the freedom of Android. Um, but yeah, Apple has really taken a bold initiative to kind of stop or at least try to curb this. It's been going on for so long. And a lot of these applications are made in China um, and they're very well crafted applications. And some, what people have to understand is that the applications that are coming out of China, it's not like the Chinese government is in there and they're meddling all the time and they're creating these secretive applications to go and just spy on us. We're naive if we're thinking that. What is happening is that the companies within China are doing this for legitimate purposes to grow a business or whatever the case may be. And then at some point, the Chinese government steps in, right? And that's the point to where TikTok, right? And I'm just speculating, obviously, I don't know too much about the business side of TikTok. But what I imagine has happened is that TikTok grew from a, from a very small organization to this large global phenomenon that all of these kids are using. And then now the Chinese government has a vested interest in the amount of data that they're pulling in. So it's, it, you know, there's a lot of uh, preconceived notions that these Chinese app dev companies are just doing it to spy on people. Um, don't get me wrong, some may be, right? And it's not only China, it's, it's a lot of other countries as well. Um, but they may not be doing it for those purposes from, from the starting point. So um, that's been a, a little bit of a misnomer out there that, that, you know, China's the big bad entity that's creating all these apps just to spy on us. Maybe in some cases, but the majority of them are legitimate companies that at some point the Chinese government will knock on the door and say, um, we need access to your servers right now. And there's nothing that these companies can do about it. So that's the danger in it. Yeah. And they could even, yeah. they don't even have to provide reasoning. They no. just say, I and mean, that's the interesting thing about like the way China works is you don't have to provide any reasoning. You just say, give us access to your data now. You're not saying give us access to your data now so we can go through the database and, and particularly find these US people that we want to spy on. No. They're just saying, give us your data. And then the company, TikTok, with all good and meaningful, like nice intentions, they just have to do it. Right, you know? right. It's That's very interesting. interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting, the difference. I mean, here we need, we need subpoenas, we, we do, right? And I know that there's loopholes between these things, but there's a legal process that's very formal. It's uh, quite vocal at times as well um, about needing a subpoena. And if we remember um, the FBI cases with Apple to where they were asking for, and I think it was, um, I think it was the Florida shooter in which they were trying to unlock his uh, Apple iPhone after he had committed these crimes. And there was, it was extremely vocal, even in a case that's limited to one device, it was public knowledge. So that disclosure factor is much different than, 
you know, the potential of a Chinese um, entity being spied on by their own government for purposes of collecting data on other people, whether it be internal citizens, whether it be citizens of Hong Kong or the United States, um, you know, what their motivations are is, is really unknown at times. So um, it's, it's a, it's an interesting quandary that we have. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point too, because the, the culture here is that the companies are able to push back. You can push back publicly, be yeah. vocal, and then in that country, push back against the government is just not tolerated. Like there's, yeah. do, it just doesn't happen. Now, have any security researchers like gone in, ripped apart the the code base, reverse engineer it, and have like checked in to see if they're if they're doing anything interesting or or weird with the data? Yeah, I believe so to a certain extent. And I mean, where that where that really stops is at the application layer. So they can't necessarily see what the what the servers on the back end are doing with that or what the people in the data centers are doing with this data, but they can see the application. And if I can recall um, that the application, somebody did set up a Wireshark um, packet capture to look at the traffic streams to see what was going on. And apparently it was sending data. It was definitely sending data while the application was turned off, I believe, um, in turning on the microphone and activating the camera. And they did witness some of these things. And if I remember correctly, there was also a clipboard to where they were peeling information off your clipboard. So if you're using an Apple iOS device and you were selecting copy on a picture or some text, I guess that it was sending that information back. And I think that's what started this whole thing um, you know, what really kicked off this, you know, this privacy target on TikTok itself. Um, and one of the big things is, is there's so many children on this app, right? And I think that's really the big thing that, that has really infuriated a lot of people is the lack of privacy of children, right? And that's a whole nother can of worms what these kids are into on cell phones now and smartphones. They're just into so many different applications and there are, there are privacy implications to these things to when these children, and we had the luxury, right? We had the luxury of what was out there, MySpace, right? We had Napster, yeah. we had LimeWire. We were in this age to where the internet was just kind of being created and it was, it was very cobbled together. And uh, I'm really thankful for that, for having a flip phone and having a beeper. When I tell my kid about a beeper and she looks at me like I'm crazy sometimes, but I'm really grateful for having that because now, you know, you have these kids who, who were born after, you know, 2010 and their entire life may be recorded and their digital personas are recorded and, and you could pick them out in an airport from a camera pointing at them just based on their body language and, you know, how they speak. So it's very interesting to see how much privacy has gone away in the 21st century with, with the advent of just all these other different technologies. So when you compile them all, that's where things start to get very, very risky, right? And that's the slippery slope that, you know, privacy advocates like myself are always enforcing is it's a slippery slope. It's just because you're collecting, um, you know, there was this, uh, this Russian face uh, recognition app. If, if you remember, it was like, make me older or something like that. And it was this huge wave that hit social media. And within a couple of days, they had amassed just hundreds of millions of, of facial photos of, of people. And it was found out that this was, um, I guess it was a Russian organization um, that was collecting that data and nobody knew what they were really doing with it. So um, you have to think about that, right? What are, what are they using that facial recognition data for? And it's these, these waves of popularity that take over social media that are the culprits. And they're the gasoline on the fire on all of this. So we have to be really careful, very skeptical. So you had to explain a beeper to your, to your yeah. kids? <laughs> I did. I did. And the only thing that they were able to understand is that you could put like cool messages in there with numbers. So I had to like flip some of the numbers around to show them how some of those messages may look. Um, but the concept of it is just so very foreign to them. So, but it's so much, it's such like an improvement upon like carrier pigeons, right? Like that used to be a reliable form of communication. And I apologize yeah. about the light. Apparently like the sun changed. And so I was just trying to find like a better, That's <laughs> not okay. get blinded over here. No I'm problem. Move one more time. Try yeah. To no, it out. At least you're in a beautiful, beautiful spot there in Colorado. I know, right? <laughs> it's like all oh, these problems. I'm sorry. The mountains are just so beautiful. <laughs> dumping all the sunlight in here. Right. Right. <laughs> There's a, there's a thousand pound elk that's blocking my sunshine. <laughs> yeah. I nicknamed him lunch. Nice. nice. Get your bow out. 
<laughs> keeping it classy, keeping it That's classy. That's right. That's right. Okay. So Funny. I thought of you about two weeks ago because um, my I have dogs. I have two dogs and they bark when the garage door goes up. Mm-hmm. And one morning we go out there and the garage door won't open. We like There's a giant spring and the spring broke. Yeah. And so the repair guy came, said, you need some new springs. And I asked him, I said, hey, is there a way to get this to be quieter? He said, yeah, this, these types of motors are really loud. We've got these nice electric quiet motors we can put in there. And I said, okay, great. And it wasn't expensive. So I had them install and it came with like a Wi-Fi, right? Mm-hmm. Like it could connect to your Wi-Fi so you could open and close or share codes or whatever. And I was like, okay, cool. And then I went to go download the app. Like my wife downloaded it. Mm-hmm. And then I went to go download it and had a bunch of one-star reviews. Ooh. And I started reading their one-star reviews. I was like, that's odd, you know? And these people were saying that they were like sniffing the traffic or monitoring the traffic with third-party apps. Yeah. And the, and the app for the garage door was sending out 14 gigs a day. And I'm like, whoa. So I yeah, just didn't, a lot. I didn't dig, I didn't like, download it i have my wife uninstall it because we don't need the app like right right you don't need it it's too much um and but the the point was or the thing that i thought about was like how many of these iot devices are either being hacked because Mm -hmm. they're built poorly like maybe the actual manu i I doubt the manufacturer of that overhead garage door system you, you know is incentivized to ruin their brand like that right so clearly it's probably some security hack where they they left something open or use some technology and someone scanned it and then then they're they're somehow hijacking it yeah Um, but that brings into this question like all of these little iot devices they're basically all these like little mini computers that you're installing on your network yeah inside your trusted network they are what do you what do you think like how do you think about that how do you talk about that with people like what's your what's your main talking points on security and iot well you know, it's, it has become such a problem in cybersecurity. There was a light at the end of the tunnel at one point in my career. Um, and if I can revert back, I wanted to share a story about how I yeah. came into this field, which, which is a kind of an interesting thing. And it, it does, it segues into where we are today and why you hear so much of the, there's no light at the end of the tunnel, why all the security professionals now are saying, you know, we're always behind the curve. We're always, we're always counter punching to a punch. Um, but real quick story. So when I was, I was 17 um, and my parents, they owned an asphalt chemical company and um, I was doing work for them all summer, just trying to save up enough money to buy my first car. I was 17. I was a senior in high school and I finally saved up about five grand at the end of the summer. And I went on eBay and I bought a um, Toyota Celica. Um, only the eBay page, when I clicked on it, it redirected me unknowingly to a spoofed eBay website. So this was back in 2004 timeframe, 2005 timeframe. Um, so I ended up sending about $5,000 for Romania and I never saw my money back, called the FBI and they brought me to school on this new thing that was happening on eBay. eBay was new. It was really new back then. And um, I was just so impressed by it. And it really took me for a ride in my career to get really immersed in technology and specifically security, which took me through, you know, the military and then the intelligence community. And now I'm back to the commercial sector, kind of where I started out. Um, but as, as I went through my career, before we had IoT labeled as IoT, IoT has always been there. Everything's a thing, right? So everything with an IP address has always been IoT, whether it be a computer or a desktop or a laptop, smartphone. Now we've taken it upon ourselves to connect just about everything, right? Your garage door opener, um, our baby cameras, our home thermostats, our Nest monitors, um, home security systems, anything, everything is now being connected. And it's very frightening. Um, it, the reason why it's frightening is because, you know, my team, one of our primary jobs is uh, to hack organizations. That's what we get paid to do, to hack into companies, um, to respond to data breaches and to inform security teams and organizations how to secure themselves. We see the bad most of the time. We, we're, we're either cleaning up, we're hacking in, and we're, we're exposing and finding flaws to relate to these, um, these companies. The more devices that we have connected to the internet, it's just simple math. We don't have enough security professionals to ever secure that those amount of devices. By the year 2020, we're expected to have over 10 billion IOT devices, 10 billion. Okay. So that's more people in the world. 
thinner in the world right now. I, you know, by 2025, it just, it starts to grow exponentially uh, 20 billion by 2025. And this is what these statistics are saying. So it's, it's a, it's a problem that only is compounded by how many devices are now being connected. And these manufacturers, they don't really, it's not that they don't really care about security. It's just that it's not their first priority. Their first priority is when they hire a development team to get those applications out quickly, to not really worry about all the secure software development lifecycle stuff and do code reviews and checks and static and dynamic analysis of code and have somebody try to break in. It's just to get this app out there just because they're on a, they're on a tight deadline. They've got a budget for development. And what happens is when they reach that budget for development, they offshore it or they find a group of developers that are very cheap. And we all know what happens when you find cheap developers. You get cheap code, you get bad code, and you get code that's hacked into very easily by, if you're lucky, my team. If you're unlucky, it's our counterparts out there. So it's just growing exponentially and everything's becoming connected, which is you know garage door opener, right? Could it be hacked? Absolutely. Is it already? We don't know, right? It, it very well could be, and it could be- it might be a lead for you guys. Hand that over to your sales team. Screenshot the reviews on that app. <laughs> It could be. I mean, and there's just, there's so many, right? And even in our, um, you know, our penetration testing, we find lots of IoT devices and we're always beating them up because the manufacturers very rarely secure them. Um, and we've got some, we've got some pretty cool stories around those as well. So, yeah. Around securing the IoT devices? Yes. And, well, around hacking into them. So. Okay. Um, what's, what's one of the, what's one of the crazier ones? So we work with a lot of manufacturers and manufacturers are traditionally very, you know, they're notorious for having lots of IoT devices. They have, you know, conveyor belt systems that relay products. They have systems that do everything that are connected to the internet. Sometimes they're exposed to the internet. Gas pumps, right, are, are exposed to the internet as well. There's a site out there and I'm probably not doing myself any favors by telling people this because I'm sure you have some people that are maybe a little bit curious watching this podcast, but there's a service called Shodan. Have you ever heard of it, Shodan? No. Okay, so Shodan is basically, they call it the bad guy's search engine. Um, but what it is, is it's the search engine for the internet of, of things. So Shodan.io, you can find an interactive map with every IoT device that is reachable all over the world. So you can go onto this interactive map, you can pull it up and you can see every single device that's connected. And that, as soon as that site was created, we saw so many hacks. I mean, it was out of control. It was out of control. We were actually calling businesses, um, especially local businesses and letting them know, hey, in our research, we found that your organization has like 65 devices that are exposed to the internet and unsecured. We're telling you now, so you don't get hit. And sometimes we would get a response, sometimes we wouldn't get a response, but, um, that's the site to where everything is really exposed from. And that what, they, what they do is they have these, um, Shodan has these scanners that continuously scan large blocks of IP addresses across the internet. And as soon as they pick up a, a known port or a protocol for a device, um, it's usually correlated back to um, some kind of a device, right? Whether it be a gas pump or a wind turbine, right? Wind turbines are out there. I mean, you're talking everything. Critical infrastructure is on this site to where you can actually click on a camera and go and look inside of a power plant right now. I mean, thousands of them, hundreds of thousands of open camera systems. It's very disheartening to see. And that's, that's the battle that we're fighting right now is not really against the hackers. It's not, it's just against these businesses that are doing things unknowingly, exposing themselves. And we're trying to bring them to school on please just don't do that. It, it saves you from being that low hanging fruit to where they pluck off the tree. Which brings me into a, an interesting topic. I didn't have planned to talk about today, but I've been thinking a little bit about like risk, like appetite for risk. Mm -hmm. And, I, and the, the, the thing that sparked this is my conversations between so my brother's a doctor and my stepmom's a doctor. And so, you know, we have a, a thread going essentially like this conversation between, the three of us and I'm, you know, bouncing like the whole mask Corona thing, like mm, off of yeah. them, like, cause their opinions, you know, have changed throughout the whole past six months as, as most people's have is. And, uh, what I've, what I've learned from watching, I'm like a huge fan of like observing. So what I've learned from watching, you know, 
my wife play social justice warrior with arguing with people about the mask and all, mm-hmm. and all of this types of stuff uh, is, is that people have different appetite for risk. Yeah. And so I can see how frustrating it could be to say, hey, look, your technology, you're completely open, you're 100% mm-hmm. vulnerable. And some people just be like, okay, next. Yeah, like, next. Yep. Yeah. Yes, yes. You know, COVID's been an interesting, um, you know, a risk management tool for a lot of people. And, and, and it's true, risk, COVID is crisis management, right? And it's down to its bones, business contingency and continuity. So all those things, they flow and they, they intertwine with that. Um, Risk tolerance is definitely something that we've seen in organizations. Um, they have different perspectives on it, like you said. One thing that's really opened up organizations to understanding their cyber risk a little bit as more of a deeper subject and something with a lot more gravity um, is ransomware. Look, ransomware, I've sat with CEOs of organizations on multiple occasions, one of which who was in tears because he had to let go of the majority of his employees. Um, and his business was going to fold under and it did. Right. So we're talking about something that's not just code ruptured or, you know, your, some of your systems are knocked down for a little while from a denial of service attack. You're talking about your family and friends that may work for a business that you've built with your bare hands or a business that your father and mother have passed down to you. You're talking about a business that is now shut down. You're having to let people go, lay them off, fire people because of cyber attacks. So the gravity of the situation has become a lot more drastic and people I think now are awake to that. It, the fact that it is not just, it's not just some far off concept in the matrix that, Oh, the systems got hacked. IT will fix it. No, it could mean that you're out of millions of dollars because you've got to reimburse um, cyber attackers or you've got to pay off cyber criminals. You've got to pay your lawyers. You've got to pay regulatory fines if you're in a regulated uh, organization. You've got to pay for the downtime, uh, which one of the businesses that we worked with, they had a ransomware attack and they were losing a quarter million dollars a day, right? That's not a lot to some organizations, but to this particular business, it was quite a bit. Um, so the gravity of these situations now, they these these hackers, are, these cyber attackers, I don't call them hackers because we're in the hacker community and hackers aren't bad guys. Hire a hacker. That's the one thing you should take away from this. Hire a hacker. Um, but these cyber attackers, they're throwing haymakers at these companies now. They're going for the throat and they're going there quickly. And the scariest part about this is, is that the cyber attackers that used to cause a lot of damage in the past, a lot of damage, they were extremely sophisticated. They knew how to code, right? We, all, we were all brought up in that generation to understand how to write our own tools and how to use command lines and things like that that were a little bit more obscure, that weren't as, they weren't publicly available to everybody. Now, there's a tool for everything that's freely available on an operating system that's already built for you to attack enterprise organizations. So now you have kids, kids who don't know how to code, who are able to hack into Fortune 5 businesses right? Twitter. I can't wait to see the story that comes out of that. That was a social engineering attack. So most likely it didn't even involve a whole lot of systems. It didn't involve a whole lot of code, maybe not even any. It likely just involved a group of talented social engineers who are young. I know one of the kids was six, uh, 17 and conveniently down in the location to where I'm I know, to be. <laughs> right? So you I'm gotta like, be oh. scared now. All the Tampa kids are scared because you got Tyler coming now. <laughs> oh boy! Oh boy! You know what's interesting is that I I imagine that you know some of them will be at Black Hat conferences and you know some of the different shows that are out there later on in their lives, and I hope they find their path right because that life of crime leads to well, one place usually. I have opinions on age, yeah, and specifically because I was a sixteen and seventeen year old, yeah, individual, and I'll tell you. You know, I'd say around then I, I, I had taken the, the path to business technology because mm-hmm. that just is the, you know, my parents, the real estate company, I'd go to there after school and solve their problems. And that was more interesting than me, you know, testing security of yeah. other people's systems. Yeah. But there was a, there was a couple of years uh, where I got really into it. There was a site way back in the day. I don't know if it still exists, but it's called like hack this site. Mm-hmm. And it was like, a, and I found this basic book on, on security and like white hat hacking yeah. at Best Buy when I was like 10 or 11 and I 
got interested in it and started doing tutorials and understanding things. And but there's a curiosity thing. And, but I guess my opinion or the things that I wanted to think about is like when the kids are that young, yeah, definitely have to give them some flexibility to make mistakes and be stupid. Yeah. Cause at the end of the day, it's just a computer with an internet connection to them. They don't, they're not, you know, 30 something and understanding the gravity of what they're actually doing. They're just like, right. oh, dude, it'd be so cool to post as Elon Musk. And like, yeah. should they go to jail for 10 years for that? Probably right. not. You right. Know? Right. I agree. I, I agree. And it depends on the type of attack, right? Like 15 years ago, you know, if, if a kid did that, they would get a lot more leeway because there weren't so many laws and regulations. But I mean, as, a, as an industry, everybody has really been sickened by how much this has happened. So it depends on the type of attack, right? If they're stealing money, then it is what it is. They're doing, a, it's, the, it's essentially that's looked at as the same thing as going to rob a bank or robbing a group of people, of which this case was. There's a lot of attacks that are, um, they're called hacktivists and they are doing it for a purpose, right? They're doing it because of something that they believe in. And then sometimes it's just because of curiosity. Now the w number one way, and you know, I've talked to a lot of people that are on the other side of the fence, which we know who they are, some of them. And I've talked to people who have gone from that side of the fence over to this side and they all have one thing in common. How do they get into it? Guess what? Online gaming. And number one, hands down, if yep. you're on, if you're on online gaming, there's there is a very good chance that you have been asked to come to some kind of a forum outside of the game, and that's where it starts. Whether or not it's like Fortran or anything of the sorts, that's where it starts, and that's where that creativity turns from online gaming to I know this group of people that I'm gaming with to now we've turned this into a game to go and hack these organizations and these sites, and they become very talented at it. They become very talented at it. So, you know, we want that talent. We want that talent. That kind of raw talent to think like a criminal is what separates the, the really, really good in this field from the, you know, okay, right? But those, those kids who grew up in that sort of lifestyle or just even somebody who understands that lifestyle or can understand how a criminal thinks, they're highly valuable in this field. And I've got colleagues who have been on that side and now they're, leading organizations over here making a ton of money doing it so um you know there's positives over here so come on over yeah. when you're done and uh yeah right <laughs> i don't i don't know how to articulate ex uh, how to articulate this exactly but i feel like a 17 year old robbing a bank mm -hmm. is worse than a 17 year old hacking some site and stealing money like there's just yeah, something about is. the in-person adrenaline having the gun like all of this other yeah. stuff that is is just I, and again i don't have the words for it but it's just mm -hmm. different it's very um, different yeah so uh, i'm curious i you've got an amazing background uh nsa and now vp security at igi i was talking with christopher gregg who's over at gilware and they work a lot with like insurance companies mm -hmm. that will do cybersecurity insurance and then when they get hacked the people like will do a ransomware attack and yeah. then they will call up gilware and then gilware will, like um you know, somehow like determine if it's like a legitimate hack and if they should pay out. They, they're like on the insurance yeah. company side. They're somewhere in that business model. Mm -hmm. But from that conversation, he was, he was talking with me and he said that like, there are these farms of people that are like hacking and they're like businesses and they go to work and they're like in buildings in public and mostly in other countries. And with your experience, like with NSA and all of that, like, are there a lot of those out there? Or, or is that true or is it an overstatement or no it's not an overstatement i'm mean, you know, just a lot of countries that are out there they they don't have the laws to govern you know these businesses in the same way, way that we do um the overtness of them maybe of questions sometimes do i ag i agree that there are centers that are out there um, that are dedicated to this, we, you get phone calls from them, right? Those are the, those are some of the same groups that are actually doing some of these ransomware attacks. In some cases, the, the calls that you get of, I've, I've, I've gotten one, um, a couple years ago, which was particularly funny of which I ran with for, a, for a little while. And it was, we've kidnapped your cousin, right? And they knew my cousin's name and they had all this information on him. And, you know, 
but those are those are the groups and you can hear people talking in the background of those places so you have to figure if they're doing that of course you know if they can pick up another set of skills and go into rob some companies online uh online then then yeah absolutely um it's rare that they're caught and brought to justice that's i think the one um thing that we've all kind of looked at and scoffed at is, is how difficult it really is. Um, if they're based in the United States, um, then it's probably a lot easier to prosecute them. Um, but in a lot of cases, I was reading an article and there was, um, you know, the, the top dog hacker out of Russia who's done all these bank hits and all this kind of stuff. And they showed him standing there with a bunch of police officers in Russia and he was standing outside of his Lamborghini, I think it was. And they were just talking and they were like, we're, and he's the most wanted by the FBI right now. So, you know, sometimes it's just comical of how much money these organizations are making. I mean, I've been on the side of, you know, responding to ransomware. That's been a highlight of my career, you know, highlight reel, right, is responding to ransomware. And it is a lot of money that they've, they've got to shell out to these companies. The insurance part is interesting. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've been in situations where the insurance company has not paid out because they've, they've come in and they've found either negligence on the part of the business or they found out that, look, that little application that you're filling out when you go to get cyber insurance, you better know what you're putting on there. I'm just saying, because when, when you get hacked as an organization or if you have ransomware, a ransomware attack, they will ask you all sorts of questions about how this transpired, about how they got in. And if they find that on that initial application that there's a just a glaring discrepancy from how you said you are protecting your network to how they got in and you may have lied or maybe something had changed, they can deny your claim. They absolutely can. And you know, we see that a lot with with cyber insurance. It's either it's either that route or it's the fact that you know, one of my customers is a, you know, a $500 million business and they've got a million dollar insurance policy for cyber. It's like, you know, what is that going to cover? You know, it's not covering anything for you. That's a drop in the bucket for you guys. So, you know, adequate insurance is definitely important. It's not the end all be all. And you got to be really careful about what you're saying on those applications as well. So, yeah. Have you guys got, do you guys have that business model at all where you work with like the insurance companies? A little bit. I try to stay, uh, I try to keep my team out of that just because of conflict of interest stuff. Um, uh, we do have preferred insurance companies that we work with. Um, we have, we actually work with a ransomware broker as well, which is really odd. So what this company does is they, they basically interface with the ransomware threat actors. What, why my organization would respond and try to recover a company from whatever has happened this company's job is to talk with the ransomware threat actors and negotiate pricing between them and the business. Here's the, here's the problem, right? Is that when an organization is hacked or they, they have a ransomware attack, the ransomware threat actors are asking for a million dollars in Bitcoin. This company doesn't have a million dollars in Bitcoin. And to get a million dollars into a Bitcoin wallet, you're talking a week. You know, you're talking a significant amount of time to float that much money over. So what these uh, ransomware brokerage companies are doing is they understand that that time is money. So if a business is out for a week, that million dollars doesn't mean anything because they've lost 15 million in that week. But if that broker can get in there on day one, pay that ransom, and then get their business back up and running, then they have a nice business model. It's so weird. How Ooh, that's this an amazing business model. I'm telling you. I already you. have the money. Like I would, as my yeah. as being a ransomware uh, broker, I would yeah. have all the money in all the different weird formats that these yeah. attackers are going to want it in. And then I save you operating costs by yep. paying it quickly. That's insane. That's such it's, a. It's nuts. It's nuts. And those wow. are the new businesses. Funny story actually about that. So it was about four years ago. I was with another organization leading a team and one of my consultants, um, he was responding to a local ransomware attack and they had trouble finding a Bitcoin account. So the CEO of the company who is, who is hacked asked his employees, do you know anybody who has a lot of money in Bitcoin? We need, we need somebody to come in and we'll pay them in cash and give them a little bit on top to give us their Bitcoin. So they had this guy come in and it was one of the friends of one of the employees and he's sitting there in the IT room with my, with my consultant. And my consultant is having small talk with me. He goes, so what do you do? The guy turns to me and he goes, I sell drugs. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. And so I'm getting this text message while he's in there and he's like, this is the weirdest conversation I've ever had in my entire life. He goes, there's a drug dealer here who has a large Bitcoin wallet and he's helping us out. I'm like, that's the level of complexity that this, it's just, 
it's still the wild west it's it's comical sometimes so that was funny, that was a funny i love story. how i love how as humans our social networks operate and we can come together around causes which is <laughs> you know like it's true yeah i want i want us to come together as a world or a country towards one specific goal I don't know. I've said it like two or three times now. And as I hear myself saying it, like I want it more yeah. and more, like I want to feel that feeling that we had as unity, like launching the first space shuttle uh, yeah. to anything, maybe it's AI or security or whatever it may be. Yeah. But, um, all right. So I had, a, I had a specific question. I had a couple of specific questions for you. Sure. That you, that I just kind of like jotted down while you were talking earlier. Mm -hmm. All right. So the first one goes back to our question, um, about, let's use the Twitter hack as, as the example. And so yeah. what I want to get at, the result I want, is I want to know at what moment does the like illegal thing happen? And so like, let's just say I'm social engineering and I make like, uh, I buy like a Twitter domain that's like similar to Twitter, but it's not. Mm -hmm. And I make like a login page. I'm just going to capture that. And like I send a password reset email to someone and they get you spoofed a little similar to how you, how you got redirected from mm -hmm. uh, eBay. And then they enter in their password and then I log in as them and then I post as Elon Musk. Like, you know, and then it's a financial thing. Like, is the first illegal thing the financial posting? As a, like, nope. wh what is the illegal thing? It's way back. Like when okay. you first started, right? Having that motive and then putting an action to that motive is essentially where the crime happens, right? So even if you didn't steal anything financially, you didn't steal any money and you just captured somebody's credentials, let's say you sent a phishing email to somebody and they gave you their credentials back, you've committed a crime. But like, but, so, okay, because I, I disagreed with your first part when you said motive and action creates yeah. the crime because you would have to break a law to create the crime. Exactly. So, so exactly. The, the law that, so they're breaking a law when they send the phishing email. They're breaking a law when they send the phishing email under the Can Spam Act. It's called the Can Spam Act, and that was um, that was in originally intended to curb pornography and spam way back in the day. So they're they're essentially breaking that by sending an email to a recipient that that doesn't want that email. And not only that, they've taken a step beyond because they're they're trying to capture non-public information from that employee. They're trying to capture personal information from that employee. And once that personal information is transferred, I have something that I shouldn't have that is a secret of that employee. And it's actually company property. So if it's a company system, like in the case oh. of Twitter, right? So in the case of Twitter, me having credentials for an employee can be considered property of Twitter because it's resident on their systems. It was a, it was um, it was given to that employee from the company, and I've stolen it. So that's where a crime happens. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. Which then like brings up the question: If I got your credentials from like a, okay a, another database or another yep. system, you're reusing passwords. Is it yeah in property? So no, that that's that's public information at that point. So information that's been disclosed in a public data breach is already public information. And you have committed no crime by stumbling upon that on Pastebin, right? Whatever the case may be, or Troy Hunt, right? So you've committed no crime on stumbling upon that information. But if you use that information, you're essentially back in that position where you're now using something that was publicly available to now try to break into a company or break into a system. And, and in, Breaking into somebody's email account is breaking into a system that you shouldn't be in that is property of that company or property of Microsoft or property of Twitter, whatever the case might be. So with the, the security uh, or the password managers, like there's LastPass and 1Password, like mm -hmm. what's, what's happening? Both of those things? Or? Yeah, yeah, it's both of them. So usually when you get those notifications, it's because the... Um, you know, if you're using LastPass, they, they've contracted with a company that does, you know, dark web scanning. So dark web, surface web, you know, doing all that kind of scanning and looking for password dumps. And once they stumble across a password that has been compromised, they let you know. So it could be on, you know, a nefarious website. It could be publicly available on, um, you know, a good guy's website, right? Haveibeenpwned.com is a, is a website <laughs> where you can, you can actually go on Have I Been uh, pwned.com, P W N E D. 
com, and you can type in your email address and it will tell you if you've had an account compromise. And I think there's also a password checker on there as well. So they're scraping from different locations, just letting you know, hey, something bad happened. Uh, that's great. Um, you know, dark web scanning, service web scanning to find out that information is really, it's, it's valuable insight, but it's sometimes a little too late. So that's the only problem. It's usually what happens is when you get these large lists, right? If, if a service is compromised and I'm an attacker and I have this huge treasure trove full of information, I'm going to sell it. I'm going to sell that for the, to the highest bidder that I can find. And that highest bidder is then going to take that and they're going to break it into very, very, very fine chunks. And there's, there's essentially two types of threat actors. Well, there's a lot of types of threat actors, but the ones that are more common are the ones that hold those credentials and they just send, they just sell them out. They farm them out. They get people to purchase them. And they're really kind of hands off on that crime aspect of it. They buy them in huge bulk quantities and then they put it out there in, in little chunks, right? I've compromised company A or I have companies A credentials for all of their employees. They put it out there, they'll get a bidder. And they can do that 500 times and just keep on breaking up this big list. By the time that whole list gets out there and it's actually public, it's like, you know, really late unless the company, unless the company who is hacked into recognizes that it happened and then they tell everybody your account was compromised and then it's public. So. Okay. So we have a lot of, you know, engineers, directors, technology, CTOs, VPs, all those types of people listening. Uh, what are like the top three one-on-one type things that they could be doing to help protect themselves or their organization? So, um, you know, that's, that's a great question. And that's uh, traditionally one that's a little bit more difficult to answer for organizations that are managing themselves. And, you know, I, I always recommend now we're in a, we're in, you know, kind of a status to where going out and procuring a second set of eyes is pretty easy to do going and finding a firm to tell you, where you need to shore things up is a pretty easy action to take. Um, the number one thing is make a plan and base it on best practices and base it on industry standards. And for the, the CTOs and the CIOs and the CISOs out there, you know what I'm talking about. The, the 20 critical controls from the Center for Internet Security, NIST, HIPAA, if you're a health a, you know, regulated entity, um, PCI for somebody who swipes credit cards, find a trusted framework and assess yourself against that framework and be honest, be brutally honest in your assessment of yourself to find where are your discrepancies, where are your gaps, and then make a plan on mitigation. Hold people accountable is number two, if not number one. I would actually put that back up to number one is hold yourself accountable, take ownership, and hold other people accountable. Go Jocko Willink on your cybersecurity. Yeah. <laughs> right? Accountability is king. And if there's nobody accountable, guess what? Nothing gets done. And there's nobody whose uh, feet to, are to the fire when that something doesn't get done or when that organization is compromised. CISOs get fired a lot. And, I, and you know what? I understand. I get it. They get fired when their organizations get hacked into. Um, but sometimes, you know, in being that leader, hold people accountable, give them ownership of something and tell them specifically, this is your job. You are meant to secure this and hold, hold them to it. Um, Number, number three, I would say, is measure the effectiveness of your security program. That's the one thing, too, where I, I see it a ton, right? And being a virtual CISO to organizations is a lack of uh, metrics. It's, and it really boils down to that. It's, it's usually the case to where, oh, you know, we set out a security plan three years ago, and, um, you know, we're still working on it. We're chipping away. And it's like, okay, where are your metrics? You know, where are your quarterly reports? Have you, have you formulated a quarterly risk report to show what you've done and what you still have to do? Or are you just kind of flying by the seat of your pants? So, um, you know, accountability, have a game plan and make sure it's based on best practices, not what you think is a good idea, right? That's never a good thing. If I walk into an organization and I say, um, Tyler Ward's top 10 for security, you know, they're going to look at me like, what are you talking about? You know, I hope they would base it on a structured set, uh, a structured criteria and security that's proven, right? Um, the CIS 20 critical controls, I'm a huge fan of those. And the, the reason is, is because it was a, it's a set of security standards that was originally created by the Department of Homeland Security and the NSA when they said to each other, let's write a list to get rid of 80% of the cyber attacks that we're seeing. 
And that list has, has just grown from there. And it really has remained that, you know, that list to knock out 80% of those cyber attacks that's out there. And it's very effective. Now it's managed by a commercial party. So those would be my three. Now let's say I go look up that list or like NIST or something like that. And I just have a lot of questions. Are mm -hmm. you like, is your company, do they do that as a service? Like could people reach yeah. out and and like meet with your team and ask them some questions because they're like oh i listen to this guy talk he's pretty awesome we've got uh, we've, we've got something in place but it'd be good to have you know tyler's team look at it are you open to that like is that something you do yeah absolutely yeah cons we're consultants first and foremost and it's not um it's not purely on the ethical hacking side or the um incident response side those are things that we do. Um, we do them very well. We've got some really talented people, um, but we're consultants. So it's just a, it's a very mix of con, uh, consultations that we provide either long-term or short-term projects. So to answer your question, yes, always, you know, you can definitely reach out to us and ask for help. Um, I always encourage people to do that. And you know, the, one of the big things in security is, is we've all got to do it is put ego aside, put it away, right? We don't know everything. Inside of these organizations, if you're running an IT team, you're running an operation, you say, you know what, I implicitly just trust my team, you've got a problem. I'm telling you, you've got to audit your team and your team should be on board with the fact that they want to be audited as well. Not from an auditor who's coming in wearing a black tie and a suit, but somebody who's coming in or doing that yourself to audit yourself, or audit your best practices, to look on Shodan and see if you're exposed to the internet, right? To do these things, act like an attacker. Because at the end of the day, you know, we, we've been with so many organizations that have said to us, we thought we were good. We spent so much money on security, so much. We spent $5 million last year on this new tool. And they found out that an attacker 17 years old was able to hack into Twitter. Do you have any idea how much money Twitter probably spends on security? I have no idea, but it's got to be a lot. It's, it's, probably, it's probably definitely over $10 million. Definitely. Maybe probably, probably, I don't think a hundred million is a horrible guess. I don't think so either. I think that's actually probably pretty accurate if you consider, you know, DevSecOps and all that kind of stuff that they do as well. All of that money and you've got a group of kids that got it, right? That's where we're at in security. And it's because we've, we're relying on the money when sometimes it's just a very, very simple equation of removing yourself as the low hanging fruit. And the people aspect of it, that's tough, right? We all joke about it. And, you know, the hacker community, they, can, they say you can spend all of your money on systems. And if you, don't, if you don't have your employees as cybersecurity sentinels for your organization who are very savvy on social engineering, then guess what? If they're a marked target, somebody's getting in. And it's true. Just happened with Twitter. happens with big banks. It happens all the time. It happens with the federal yeah. government, right? <laughs> yes. It, it, look, signal versus noise right yeah like it's if somebody i i was giving a talk and it was it was an older crowd and so this gentleman came up to me after the talk and the talk was about what i had learned about from speaking to all of these great leaders in technology and he came up to me after the talk and he goes uh, i'm retired and i have a lot of money he goes i'm scared that people are going to get my money he's like what do you do and he's like people can just go in i was like because I had said something along the lines of if you're a target and people want it bad enough, they're going to get it. But mm -hmm. you've got this protection of there's so many devices online. And so the business models that have shifted for like people just randomly scanning IP blocks, finding open yeah. stuff that's easy to get and can run automated attacks and then find mm -hmm. out there's useful stuff and lock it up. So I, I was just, you know, talking with him about technology. And I, I guess the, um, the takeaway from that was I just said, do you have, two-factor authentication like ask your bank for two-factor authentication that was like the one thing i could give the poor guy who was like scared for his money yeah. i was like do you do that do you get a text before you log in do you have two factories like no i was like we'll call the 1-800 number on the back of your car and ask them to help you set up two-factor authentication yeah. that's like the one thing you could do today because you know i was walking out of a talk <laughs> like i'm yeah. trying to go get some lunch <laughs> yeah it's like i'm hungry yeah, yeah. two fa that's like that's like the default and you know uh, and I find it really beneficial to, I, I always equate cybersecurity and cyber attacks to covert and overt operations for the government. And I forget the name of the book, but I actually, oh, I've got a book called Spycraft and I recommend it to anybody who's out there who wants to read a really cool book. 
it's called Spycraft, and it's all sorts of um, early tech gadgets from the CIA. And it's, you know, real CIA. It's got pictures, so I'm a big picture guy, and it's got all sorts of really cool stuff in it. But um, the, the, the CIA, right, they say, and, and every time they're in covert operations, is don't be a target. Stop being a flamingo out there, <laughs> right? You're like the peacock in the middle of a crowd, and this is social media, right? And I know we're on a podcast right now. We're obviously we're on social media, but when you're on social media, a big um, point that I always give to my clients is don't be a target, right? When those, when those quizzes come up that ask you what your mother's maiden name is and your favorite color and your favorite type of food, guess what? Those are your security questions for a lot of your banking websites as well. So be careful. The things you post, right? The, the pictures that you post on social media, they can be geotagged. So an attacker can go onto your Facebook, copy a picture, pop it into an online uh, program, and they can find out and pinpoint your exact location when you took that picture. So if you're on vacation. The, the internet has become a treasure trove of data of which they can find out who you are and they are likely just stumbling across you at times. That's the thing is stop letting them stumble across you because you're so out there. Another thing is, you know, I usually tell people who ask me that question as well, how do I secure myself? Go freeze your credit, freeze your credit, keep it frozen. And if you're not using your credit, if you're worried about identity theft, keep your credit frozen until you're ready to buy a house, buy a car, and then do a temporary lift on the freeze and then freeze it again. That at least provides you another set. You can of freeze credit? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Keep your fret credit frozen all year long. It costs nothing. We can thank Equifax for their snafu um, because now it's free across all three credit bureaus. Uh, but if you call TransUnion, um, Experian, and Equifax, or if you go online, just Google freeze my credit, um, just hit all of the three credit bureaus, freeze your credit, and that way when you're going to open up a new line of credit, you'll either call or go online, enter your passcode, lift the freeze temporarily, set it for like a day, and then lock it back down. That provides you a lot of protection. Another thing that is becoming a little bit more prevalent is you talked about MFA. MFA on bank accounts is great. Use MFA on all of your accounts, but call your, tel your cell phone provider and tell them you want to prevent SIM swapping. Okay, because now guess what? The identity of all of us is the iPhone and it is your Android, your Samsung Galaxy. And if somebody can call and socially engineer Twitter, they can call and socially engineer Verizon and they can let them know, hey, I am Joe Schmo and I want to swap my SIM over to my brand new device. Here's my manufacturer code. And guess what? That immediately swaps all the data from your system over to the attacker's cell phone. And they've got all of your MFA tokens and they've got your face ID. They've got all of it. So they don't need it anymore. They don't need your phone. So that's crazy. So you can call them and you can basically this freeze my credit and mm -hmm. prevent SIM swapping. These are things that just put, they're basically a multi-factor ways to, you know, get these things done. I, I'm not saying it very clearly, but you get yeah. you know, the text message stuff when you, and that's like what the API supports, like usually on, upon login, but there's these yeah. other things that happen in the real world that are different than logging in and you can freeze your credit and you can mm -hmm. call and then you get like some password if you want to mm -hmm. actually uh, swap your SIM later in the future or something. Yeah, they'll, they'll have you set up a, you know, a pretty complex password. I know some providers use like a 15 digit code. Um, pretty long, right? So you've got to keep that copy down somewhere, but it, it at least provides another layer, right? And it's all about creating these layers, whether it be personal protection or whether it be organizational protection, it's creating these layers. And what a lot of organizations have not yet realized is that your personal Gmail account and the route into your personal life is a soft target into that Fortune 5 or Fortune 10 business. And that's what they're going after. They're not knocking on the front door usually. They're going after the executives of organizations because they're soft targets. They do so much to secure their infrastructure, they forget about themselves and they're out there on social media giving it all away and giving somebody an avenue into not only their life, um, but their organization as well. So those two things are kind of hand in hand now. Earlier you were talking about, you know, this concept of, you didn't say it exactly like this, but trust, but verify as far mm -hmm. as like auditing your team and all of in, in that. And so I was curious, you know, we, we have a, a culture that favors measurement over at our company, like where we track yeah. stuff like week over week or month over month and things like that. But how do you, how would you 
advise a, a leader on approaching their team about security and like let's say they approach them and they get like a response like oh we got this we've got these things like how do you would, would you go back to like that that list of the 20 things and ask them you know hey check what you're doing against these 20 things like how do you have that conversation how do you I, i'm getting to it i promise you i'm getting to the question i'm getting to the it's it's getting better as we go okay it's not not scripted how do you have the first conversation about security with your team mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so you know five years ago hard conversation to have and even still today um you know when my when my team is hired into take over a security program and we've got to, you know, we're still working with IT. It's always a different dynamic. Um, you're essentially stepping on somebody's sandcastle when you walk in. So you got to be a little bit careful. Um, luckily in the last few years, it's become an easier conversation because of ransomware. That's the only good thing that ransomware has ever brought to the table is the fact that I can call a CEO and say cybersecurity and they equate it to financial damage. That's it. That's the best thing that's happened because of that. So, what I would do is uh, to sit your team down and let them know is, hey, if this castle falls, so do we. And guess who has to clean it up? We do. And I guess who looks bad to the board? We do. And we may lose our jobs. So, you know, it's not fear tactic because it's just being realistic. I mean, we've seen organizations that have been compromised in the, C the CISO. When we get there, says to his whole team, you're all fired. You're gone. Whole team out. And they hire my team for the interim or they hire another team and they, or they start to replace people. So this is real. Now, as a, as a leader in the organization, I would either, if you have the time, which most of us don't, is audit yourselves. Because if you have your team audit their own work, obviously you're going to get maybe mixed results back with that, right? You've got you know, maybe a 22-year-old kid who's a sysadmin. He may not or she may not you know, audit their work in the same light as you would. So either do it... For, you have to do it from a third party perspective, a neutral third party, whether that be somebody inside of your organization or you as the CISO or the CTO, whatever the case may be, or you call in a third party assessment company to do that, is make the parameters clear. And as I walk into an organization to do a security assessment, I, I always tell the employees is look, this is not a slap on the hand to you at all. This is not to knock your work by any means. This is a learning experience. And that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to teach you how to secure yourselves so that I don't have to come back on my Saturday night and clean up when you get hit. And they're like, okay, that sounds good. But you do have to be careful. You've got to give them the right message. And at the end of the day, it's about getting better. And we can't audit our new work. And also, I find that one particularly nice tactic to use that um, you know I have CTOs use is let their team know, like, I don't want to beeline you from what you're doing. I need you to do these tasks for system development work or code reviews. And I need, I need this third party to do this security thing because we don't have the time to do it. And I don't want to flood your work schedule. I don't want to have you working on a Saturday morning. I want you to have a nice family time and I don't want you to have to worry about this. And then we'll re re review the results together and then we'll fix some stuff. So you know, there's a whole bunch of ways to pitch it. Um, and then the totalitarian way is we're doing it because I want to, because I know that if we don't, then we could be vulnerable in a number of different spots. And I'm not willing to take that risk as a leader. Yeah. And so. the different ways depend on the different company cultures. Sure. They do. You know, you get, you get a, a <laughs> company that military background where a lot of people working there used to be military. Yeah. Those that works very well. Very there, well. Everyone's bought into that mm -hmm. concept that, and honestly, you know, I grew up with my dad being in the air force. I know you are in the air force oh, cool. too, but um, waking up, making your bed, like, you know, the little, little disciplines here and there, yep. uh, so important. Like I'm really, I hated them as a kid, but as an adult, I'm like, Oh, I'm so, yeah. I wish I would have dove deeper into that. <laughs> like yeah. I, I did it, but, uh, I could see all the benefits. Now I was curious, which came first for you, uh, air force or NSA? So I was with the air force first. Um, so I was doing cyber ops and it operations with them for about four years and it was really cool. It was awesome. Um, got to spend just shy of a year in Afghanistan at the foot of the Hindu Kush mountains. So with my brothers and sisters from the army and the Marines and uh, <laughs> really interesting experience. Uh, my wife remembers those, you know, shoddy Skype calls where um, there's, um, you know, the air sirens going off because you're getting mortars. So great. And then I spent, uh, let's see, about eight months in a little tiny African country called Djibouti 
which is um, just about 10 clicks away from Somalia. So very hot, very hot, but um, very nice people. So I did that for a while and then I stepped out and I went to the intelligence community up in the DC, Virginia area, bounced between a couple of the army intelligence bases up there, a um, little bit at the Pentagon, and then I went down to Augusta, Georgia at the Cyber Center of Excellence and yeah. loved it. It just opened up, right? They just it opened, opened up. up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's crazy to look at it because you have you have like two things down there. You have the masters and then you have this huge cybersecurity community in the middle of rural Georgia. So it's really cool to see. And um, I enjoyed it and we're headed back down South here pretty soon. Yeah. So there's like a, like a, <laughs> I might get this wrong, but there's like a James Brown statue downtown yep. in Augusta, Georgia. Is that right? Yeah, there is a James Brown <laughs> statue. Yep. And yeah. then there's, there's some kind of a pole statue from some kind of a flood, I believe. I don't know. I never really experienced the whole, um, you know, tourist point of it down there. I was just working a lot. So, uh, but it was nice. It was, it was a nice go. And yeah, so I'm back in the commercial sector now. I really enjoy it. Um, the intelligence community and working with a lot of different agencies. I was a contractor in there. So it, it was nice to be able to bounce around between these different agencies and see the unique thing, the, the unique things that they were doing, but the commercial sector, I had this burning desire, right? They needed help. They do need help. We need help. The commercial sector is not as tight as the military. It's not as buttoned down as the government. And we just need good minds out here um, that are responsible and hold themselves accountable to secure these organizations because there's a real lack of that, you know, and it's not just from a security perspective. And that's what I tell a lot of people who are coming through or up and coming in their career field is, you know, they say, how do I get into cybersecurity? Do IT really well. That's how you get into it is go through your IT and be a steward of cybersecurity of whatever technical job that you may be working. And that's how you get into cybersecurity, which is a, a route for many. That's true. Because even as like a Ruby engineer, you can get into some security, you know, mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's, there's security pretty much everywhere. So that's, yeah. I like that. Yeah. So people want to learn more. What's, what's your website? Uh, website is igius.com and, um, or nodeware.com. So N O D E W A R E.com. And IGI is the, um, the services arm of the organization. Um, so it's my team and then, um, some other teams as well. And, uh, nodeware is our development team that makes a vulnerability scanning tool. So if you want to oh, check cool. that out, yeah, it's a really cool tool. It's kind of a byproduct of all the bad stuff that we've seen out there and giving tips to the dev team about, it would be really cool to have a tool like this and there's nothing that exists out there like that today. And we've used all of these. So it morphed into, you know, what this beautiful product is. So it's, it's a really cool organization to have, you know, really both of those services and software dev minds um, across the team. So 